So new growth theory. Modern growth theory is named new growth theory. Um, theory is recognized an important ingredient in growth. Technology, all right, this is an important thing. All right, new growth theory is a theory that emphasizes the role of technology rather than capital in growth. So we need to deal with, um, in, in a little more modern context of growth theory, we need to deal with a couple of things. Number one, we have to deal with economic institutions. So differing institutions, not just the level of capital, is extraordinarily important. So things like property rights, things like contract law, things like a, a um, security, things like um, a road system, a, a stable government that is has a well-working regulatory system. Stuff like that is extraordinarily important to growth. Also, technological development is extraordinarily important to growth. Right? We're running into the limits of what the Earth can provide in terms of natural and raw materials, natural resources, raw materials. So we have to start figuring out how do we do more with less, and that's where technology comes in. And then, um, we, so we have institutions, technology, and the third thing we really have to take into account is this idea of human capital and the human capital stock. So those countries that grow quickly are those countries that can adopt, develop and adopt new technology, um, as well as develop and adopt growth-friendly institutions. And both of those things require fairly skilled people to do. All right? So we just take, for example, welding today. All right? Welding is no longer a matter of sticking two pieces of metal together and using some kind of electrode to heat them up. Um, it, it's just way more than that. They're, they're, you, know, you have to, you're basically uh, a metallurgical, medical, however you say metal, um, technician who um, knows an awful lot about how these metals go together. Not only that, but also knows how to tell a machine how to put these metals together. So it's really important that we have strong amounts of human capital or a highly skilled workforce to be able to take advantage of these new technologies um, as well as put in place the institutions that we need. So essentially, technological advance leads to investment. Why does the technological advance lead to investment? Because it makes the return on our investment higher, because we can now do more with less. Um, that leads to further technological advance. Why? Because we're investing in this. Part of what our investment is is research and development, and that all leads to growth. Technology plays an important part in growth. So a technological advance is a result of the economy when it does the following. Um, invest in research and development. It's extraordinarily important to do research and development because we can't develop new co uh, technology without it. Um, and as a result of that, the economy, w the 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 um, country will often make advances in pure science. And it's really important to remember that pure science is 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 key to this technological development. Even though oftentimes pure science doesn't, in and of itself, have application yet. All right. Um, oftentimes we'll make a scientific advance, we'll figure something out, and then it'll be a few years later before we figure out how to apply it. Uh, a great example of this is um, microwaves. Everybody has a microwave oven, right? Microwaves were originally developed in World War II for radar. And then the company that developed them um, after World War II had to figure out a use for it and figured out, oh yeah, well, we can cook with it. Uh, it took them several years to figure that out, but they did all right but these advances in pure science even though sometimes they don't have a direct application yet oftentimes lead to important technological advances later and work out new ways to organize production of course so one of the major things that caused the um, manufacturing boom in the United States during the um, early 20th century was the idea of an assembly line um, and that was just simply a new way of organizing how the productive process happened. All right, common knowledge aspects of technology creates positive extra knowledge, which is key to growth. For example, take, exa take the example of the use of computers. All right, if we go back, say, people who were 20 years old in 1970 would have had very little knowledge of how to use a computer. Today, uh, we, we walk around with them in our uh, computers, around with them in our pockets and our cell phones. Um, computers with massive amounts of computing power relative to what um, was in existence, say, just 15, 20 years ago. Um, and this knowledge of how to use this technology 
well, it's just second nature to us, right? Uh, it's kind of like walking. We just grew up with it. Well, that allows for the use of computers within a lot of different contexts that um, wouldn't that would have 30 years ago required significant amounts of training for people to be able to do. So when we talk about a positive externality or a positive effects on others not taken into account by the decision maker, uh, this this idea um, can oftentimes um, help. So for example, let's take email. All right, the fact that we commonly use email makes email more useful because I can send you an email, you can send me an email, but if you didn't have email, well then I couldn't send you an email, and it would be less my email would be less useful to me. So that's another issue that we have within this idea of common knowledge of um, technology. All right, learning by doing is another important thing that we think about when we talk about this idea of growth theory. Um, learning by doing is to improve methods of production through experience. So you just think about this. You as you as a student, when you first start out as a student, you're not very good at doing stuff. All right, let's we go all the way back to kindergarten. You know, maybe you can't even tie your own shoes. All right, then you get all the way up to say college. You get to where you're pretty darn independent. All the way to the point now where you can take this class online, which requires a ton of uh, independent work. Right? Why are you able to do that? Well, you've learned how to be a student. Has anybody sat down and taught you how to be a student? Well, maybe a little bit, but not much. Mostly it's you are a student, and through your experience of being a student, you learn how to be a better student. So learning by doing overcomes some of the law of diminishing marginal productivity because it increases productivity of workers. So essentially what happens is if we have the same worker with the same level of experience and the same level of ability, and we just increase that one, we add another one, and we add another one, and we add another one, um, we get this diminishing marginal productivity of labor. But if those workers are changing over time, if they're getting more experience, if they're learning how to do stuff better, faster, easier, um, lear learning how to work smarter as they go through um, their, their job, then they're becoming more productive. Um, and that can counteract some of the law of diminishing marginal productivity. Uh, learning by doing increases this returns to scale. Okay, so we need to define increasing returns to scale real quick. Um, increasing returns to scale simply means that if we scale up all inputs, all right, we get more. So for example, we have one our coffee shop with one station and we're going to define a station as a register, a coffee machine, and all the stuff to make and service one customer at a time. All right? If we add two all right. Maybe we can. Uh, so we add another and a person too, not just the capital, but the person, the whole thing to run it. Let's add a second one, and we're going to have a second line. And now we can have two lines coming into our coffee shop. Oh, we could add three. Now we can have three lines coming into our coffee shop. And because we have three lines, the wait time is so much lower than the other coffee shop down the road. Um, everybody decides to come here, and so we have increasing returns to scale. Right? I mean, we just we're just able to produce more because we're more efficient because we're bigger right that's what that is and and part of this is done through this learning by doing because as you scale up as you produce more and more you have more experience producing which leads to this increasing returns to scale so it's something of a self-reinforcing cycle here Technological lock-in. Okay, does the economy always use the best technology available? Answer is no, it doesn't. Why? Because sometimes the cost of upgrading to the latest and greatest and best technology doesn't outweigh the benefit. So technological lock-in occurs when old technologies become entrenched in a market. Um, so, for example, um, landlines All right, for um, telephone service. All right, many many companies, um, UWF still has this. Use um, wired landlines rather than cellular service, or not cellular, digital mobile service. Right? Um, wouldn't a digital mobile phone be better technology? Sure it is, but all the infrastructure is there for the landlines. 
um, we use the landlines, we're used to the landlines, well then we just kind of keep them because the cost of upgrading to the latest and greatest spec technology may be greater than what benefit we get out of it. Uh, another great example of this is um, in the use of steel in producing automobiles. If we wanted to produce automobiles much more efficiently, much more fuel efficiently, much lighter, much stronger, much better, all the way around, we'd switch to using carbon fiber. But the problem, I mean, carbon fiber is stronger than steel, it's lighter than steel. Um, we can make cars that are much, much more fuel efficient by switching to carbon fiber. The problem with it is that that switchover cost is so expensive. Why? Because all of the factories that we have that make automobiles are designed to make automobiles out of steel, and none of them are designed to make them out of carbon fiber. And that switchover cost is just prohibitive. So even though more efficient technologies may be available, talked about a couple. So network externalities some, can sometimes lead to lock-in. All right, so sometimes when we talk about um, network externalities, we, it's, it's important that lots of people adopt the technology. Um, so for example, if we look at the medical industry, we have this, this push now, and it's actually regulations requiring it, a move to electronic health care, health records, right, so that they can be transferred back and forth. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a cool thing. But so why has it taken so much time and a, a um, you know, basically a law, a regulation, to require the switchover from basically paper records to electronic records, when electronic records are much more efficient? Uh, well, simple. Um, the switchover costs are pretty high, and if I'm the only one who does it, all right, say my doctor's office is the only office that does it, then I don't get much benefit out of that because I can't transfer the records from one office to another without printing them out anyways, right? So I kind of lose a lot of the benefits of the um, uh, electronic network. Another thing to think about network externalities is think about the Internet. Um, if the internet had only like four or five people on it, would it be that cool? No, not really. Um, it's only cool because there's tons and tons of people participating on the internet. Network externalities is an externality which used by one individual makes the technology more valuable to others. So the more people that use it, the more valuable it is. That's a network externality. Another key factor in growth is growth policies. General policies that are good for growth include things like encouraging savings and investment. Because if we encourage savings and investment, we have a newer, better, larger capital stock. So larger set of tools that we use to make stuff and better tools to make stuff. So encouraging savings and investment definitely has to increase growth. Formalizing property rights and reducing bureaucracy and corruption. It's very important that we have strong property rights because I have very little incentive to invest in the types of capital that I need in order to uh, produce stuff if I don't have fairly high assurance that I'll be able to retain my property, right? my property rights. Also, reducing bureaucracy and corruption. Um, generally speaking, I don't think businesses care about regulation. They care about cost of compliance. All right, Good regulation is good for everybody, including business. What's not good is highly bureaucratic regulation or corrupt regulation. So if you have to know who's the right person to bribe in order to get something done, that's bad for growth. If you have to jump through 500 hoops when two would do, um, that's not good for growth. All right, to providing more of the right kind of education. It's really important that we have a skilled labor force, particularly in the U.S. Right now, what we're looking at is a extreme deficit of moderate to moderately highly skilled workers. So we really don't have much of a deficit of high skilled workers. I'm talking master's degree and above type workers. And we don't have a deficit of low skilled workers. What we have is this in-between worker, so the welding technician, which is no longer someone who just sticks two pieces of metal together. It's someone who really has to know something about the engineering behind 
what's going on. It, uh, it's, it's actually a pretty darn skilled job. Uh, these kinds of jobs that um, programming, um, basic programming, uh, particularly of mobile apps right now, uh, that those are, are extraordinarily important middle skilled um, jobs that don't necessarily require say a four-year degree or a graduate degree but maybe a two-year degree right technical skills it's very important that's very important in the United States right now so providing the right kind of education is extraordinarily important um, promoting policies that encourage technological innovation yeah we've got to do that we have to have policies that promote research um, we have to have policies that promote um, uh, that make it easy for companies to go in and then develop a new technology and bring it to market. Um, that it, by easy, that doesn't necessarily mean non-regulated. We have to make sure that our environment is protected, that people are protected. Um, but at the same time, those regulations have to make sense. They have to be. Uh, they can't be overly bureaucratic and overly oppressive. And finally, promoting policies that allow taking advantage of specialization. So really allowing companies to interact with one another and have one company specialize in this and another in that is really important because um, that allows for increase in productivity through this specialization. Um, and, and one really important policy that can that can promote this which sounds really simple but is the truth is promoting um, transportation uh, mechanisms so trains both for people and freight um, roads both for people and freight to to get stuff from one place to another so that people can um, uh, can collaborate with one another all right so for more information um, Gary Becker is a famous economist who did a lot of work on human capital. I suggest you read this particular article.